Good evening and welcome to the Journey Bible Study. We're happy to have you with us tonight and uh, participating in our study. We hope you will participate. We know we'll have several comments and uh, welcomes from uh, those who are joining us. And we ask you to post any prayer concerns you have or any insights on the text tonight. As always... We will have four different readings. We'll share a psalm, which uh, our friend Doc Howell will be bringing to us tonight. And then I'll share our letter. We're still in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. And then Miss Jennifer, I think, has the Joshua text. And Lynn will close us out with the gospel tonight. So uh, invite y'all to post any thoughts you have, prayer concerns, and uh, we want to say a joy here we celebrate that the ripley tiger golf team squeaked out barely squeaked out another <laughs> state championship. uh i was being facetious there they won by eight, 18 strokes that's a lot no matter if, yeah, who you play i think there is it? so what a great <clears throat> uh, craig bullock finished third i believe right jim he did so congratulations to craig and to clay adams and Boy, I don't need to start naming names. I'll get in trouble, but uh, oh. Clay, we claim Clay, too. And uh, Colt. And Colt, yes. Colt and Clay. All righty. Well, uh, I'm going to slip over here to see if we have any other announcements before we get started, if I hit the right button. There we go. Good to see you on, Becky. You're the first one. You get an award tonight, Becky. <laughs> That he may be Don, right. though, so we'll give him your award if it's him instead of Becky. Uh, but we will uh, lift up any – do y'all have any uh, prayer concerns we need to mention before we get started? And I'll have our opening prayer. I know we have our normal prayer list, and we'll remember those to end, and uh, Miss Lynn will close us out tonight. So let's have prayer to begin. God, we thank you for this day. As my friend Norris Howell said, it's been a blessed day. Every day is a blessing, God, when you are in it. Even as your brother James said to us, consider it pure joy even when we go through trials and tribulations, for that <laughs> encourages us to put more faith in you. Help us to be that faithful, that trusting, because often it's fragile. We need your strength even, even to grow in our faith. We certainly need your inspiration to understand your words of life so god we surrender this study to you now beyond what we've prepared may you speak to the hearts and minds of each of us in ways beyond what we can do as mere mortals gifts of your grace and your blessed children will you come holy spirit that the father above will be glorified and we will walk more closely in the steps of jesus our savior in whose name we pray amen all righty. Doc, you are ready to kick off tonight, aren't you? It's going to be fun. It's different. Um, bear in the back of your mind as I, as I read from this 107th Psalm that the, the people of Israel are traveling in a barren land. Okay. Now, you have been there. I have not. But uh, I understand that they were traveling um, in quite a wilderness mm -hmm. and encountered many problems that they were not able to handle on their own. And so they are asking uh, God to be with them. It reminds me a little bit about Moses a few weeks ago when we were talking okay. about um, God just saying after Moses destroyed the uh, Ten Commandments and was so upset with the people. And then Moses turns to God and said, God, we just have to have you. Wow. So you'll feel That's that good. in this, in this Psalm. Now I'm going to change slightly the verses. And the reason I'm going to do that is uh, a couple of commentators. One was William Barclay and one was Brueggemann 
felt like we needed to add a verse to the lectionary on the beginning and two verses on the end. So I'm going to add a couple of verses on it, on to this, just to uh, three verses, just to uh, complete a thought. So starting uh, NRSB with uh, Psalm 107, and, and think about this as being a Thanksgiving uh, psalm. And this okay. is the Thanksgiving season. Oh, Amen. give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert waste, finding no way to an inhabited town, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. And now moving over to the 33rd verse. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a sultry waste because of the wickedness of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he sets the, there he lets the hungry live, and they establish a town to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply, multiply greatly. He does not let their cattle decrease. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Um, this overwhelming theme of thanksgiving that you see here changes from, a, from an individual that is saying, thank you, Lord, for getting me through this particular problem to the nation of Israel saying, thank you, God, for getting all of us through this problem. Oh, wow. and, and I think an under, underlying um, theme that you see here is that when you cry out to the Lord from your soul, he will answer you and will take care of you. That's very, very comforting to know. This is what Moses was asking for, and that is what we are seeing happening here. We're seeing deliverance from our troubles, deliverance from our problems um, by God. So very distinct here. This is not a psalm of, of praise. It is a psalm of thanksgiving. There's a difference in praising someone and thanking someone. This is a psalm of, of thanksgiving. And in uh, ancient Israel, uh, Brueggemann says that uh, thanksgiving is a response to a specific problem that has been taken care of by God. That's good. And so... This writer's impression that you that you see here of, of the Psalms is that uh, um, breaking it apart from a personal to a corporate. We have a corporate prayer where we all pray together in church and we have a quiet time and we pray for our individual needs. And this is a this is a psalm where we are praying for a country praying for everyone. Um, so it starts out sort of generic and ends up very, very specific. And so we know what we are asking for. We know when we are hungry, we ask for food. We know when we're thirsty, we ask for water. Um, we know when we need God's steadfast love. We say, God, we have to have you. We can't get through these problems ourselves. So um, what is trouble? Trouble has a lot of different uh, 
a lot of different definitions. And uh, uh, Brueggemann talked about about trouble just being when you you have a a situation confronting you and you don't know what to do about it. Mm, that's that's when you turn it over to God. So uh, God doesn't put any restrictions on what we ask him for, but what he does do is he does ask us to communicate with him what our problems are. And so a nation is always its greatest when a nation's leaders speak on behalf of the nation and ask God, please watch over us. Please have us do the things that would be pleasing in your sight. Uh, lead us in the paths of righteousness for your namesake. Um, I thought a lot about uh, Jennifer on this because uh, of that song, We Pilgrim Through a Barren Land. Well, they're pilgriming through a barren, barren land and they cannot make it on their own. And so they have to turn everything over to God. Now, the rest of the psalm actually breaks out four different individual things that they ask for. I don't think that's important here. Mm, that's good. Um, what is important here is that we know as individuals and we know corporately for our nation what God has done for us individually and what God has done for our nation. And we should be prepared to share that. When someone is asking, well, what has God done for you? That's good. You should be a you should be prepared to say, God has done everything for me. And look how he has blessed this nation. And so we should be immediately responsive to the wonderful things God has done for us because God is immediately responsible responsive to us when we ask God um, to do something for us. I don't think anybody has ever had their heart heavy and everyone's had their heart heavy that they can't sit down and pray and read something from the Bible and God's word will speak to them and they will have comfort. He sends us a comforter, but sometimes we need to ask for God to help us. So he is asking us to, to help us. And this closes out uh, over in the, uh, the the 33rd uh verses on down and kind of like last week where we had a type of uh of doxology this is a type of doxology as well um by his blessing they multiply by multiply multiply greatly that is um when we ask for God's blessing, he gives them to us and everything seems like it just takes care of itself. We don't lose track of the fact Brueggemann closes and I'm going to, I'm going to use, I've got, I've got a lot of other things over here that I could use, but I think it's important that he says we don't ever should ever lose track of the fact that God is, is powerful he is good. He is sovereign. He is incredibly generous. And he takes conditions that we encounter in our life that would lead us down to a path into death and turns those into gifts of life and lifts us out of the doldrums and turns them into gifts of life. Um, the uh, That's good. as you break down break down psalms this is this is from the very beginning of the last section of psalms what we call book five of the psalms there are five parts and this is the first uh, of these and it just basically concerns the fact that when god tells you something he's going to do it but you need to be communicating with God and asking God to help you through the problems 
that you really are not capable of handling yourself. I had a dear friend a few years back when they were trying to found, found the, uh, the Pine Lake Church. Pine Lake Church had not been founded yet. But he knew that the little church that they had there in Brandon was suffering. And he came, and every time he came by my office, he had his Bible with him, and he said, I'm going to pray for you and your church, and you please pray for me and my church. Mm. And he said, I just can't quite figure out what to do. And he was like a lot of us. He was trying to do it on his own. Mm -hmm. And when my friend Jerry left my office one night and he went over to Fulton and he moved, went into his uh, motel room, reached to get his Bible and he had left his Bible behind at home. He said, I never leave my Bible. And he reached in the drawer and pulled out a Gideon Bible and opened it. Gideon Bible opened to a, a portion in Ezekiel. Y'all have probably heard some of this story before, but opened into a story in Ezekiel where God is uh, talking to Ezekiel and saying, Ezekiel, things aren't going well, are they? You're trying to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. I'd sure like to partner up with you. And last week we talked about Moses being God's friend. God wants to be our friend. He wants to partner up with us. And if we'll turn our problems over to him like Jerry did, um, they went from 450 members down to 350 members. And then they all started praying and saying, God, we can't do it on our own. You're going to have to help us. Now, 25 years later, they got 14,000 members and they still are praying church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, our church is a praying church and we pray for each other and we love each other. And, and I think that's why when we come to church, we're filled with joy and blessing because we know we can bring our problems to church, bring our problems to each other and pray about them. And God takes care of them, makes them go away. So this is a corporate prayer really for all of us. Individually, we have needs, but this is a prayer for, for the country of Israel. And um, I think about the United States today and how much we would benefit if we would just uh, quit fussing at each other mm. and start praying for each other. Yeah. I think we'd all be better that parties, political parties and differences wouldn't matter nearly so much if we would uh, ask God to, to help our friends and help us. Thank you. Amen. Wow. Thank you. We can go home now. I, I think so. <laughs> I love you. You're tying about, you know, I, I'm quoting you again. To, I'm paraphrasing the trouble. It's when you don't know what to do and you turn it over to God. Goodness gracious. That's beautiful. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, I am uh, blessed to be able to share with you all this uh, letter to the Thessalonians. Let me find my reading here i'm going to use the nrsv i just have four verses uh i think no well, there we go. well i thought i had it i'm in micah here we go all righty this is from first thessalonians chapter two uh we're gonna have verses nine through thirteen here Paul and uh, Timothy and Silanus write, Silvanus rather, you remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We work night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also how pure, upright and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
All righty. Uh, remind me who had the Thessalonians reading last week. It was Doc, yeah. And uh, he made he pointed out, and I think it bears repeating, reiterating this, a reminder to us, because some of you may not have been on last week too, that this was Paul's first letter. Indeed, uh, some would say it's the first uh, uh, New Testament writing of the canon. So <laughs> before the Gospels, before, before everything. So this is important stuff, right? This is Paul... Uh, new mm -hmm. in his writings to the church the first one that was chronicle may not have been his first official writing but certainly the first one that made the canon uh canon being the scriptures um and paul he had this relationship with the church in thessalonica and uh he's really celebrating their witness of faith and doc pointed out last week which was a great observation that Paul spoke to uh, caring for the church as infants, as a mother does a child. I think that's the imagery that we had uh, of, of caring so and cherish. And we talked about uh, how precious those infants are. And, you know, Lynn, as a new grandmother, I mean, they're so cherished to us. We'll do anything for them. We want to meet their every need because, we know how dependent they are as well, right? Well, Paul is cherishing, as he said, this infant church that he was instrumental in sharing the gospel with. But here, as I was studying this week, I love the transition that, it, and you may have caught it, that Paul says here in, uh, let me find the verse. And it's not just Paul. Uh, most writers would say, you know, he points out that Timothy and Silvanus played a part in this too. So it is penned as Paul's, but uh, they certainly had influence as well. Verse 11 says this, we are, talked about the, the mama imagery of the infant last week Paul used. Here's what he uses in verse 11. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children. Now, scholars smarter than me, as I was studying here, uh, reminded me of this. Now in the first century world, uh, the nurse oftentimes was the one who cared for children in their infancy. And uh, certainly we remember the story, many of us do, of Moses being placed in the reed basket, right? And uh, Pharaoh's daughter went down and they were the nurse to the child, right? So the caregiver, the one who nurtures and cares and protects, certainly the parents have an enrollment too uh, in the parental role. But then as uh, the child grows, it is the father in that tradition who assume, assumed the more educational and even nurturing role to mentor the child. So here, isn't that beautiful that Paul is saying, we weren't just the ones who gave you birth as church people, as people of Christ by introducing you to the gospel and nurturing you when you were fragile and infantile in your faith. But he says too, that we were the ones who educated you helped you grow in wisdom and become uh, more stable in your faith and uh, more affirming in your witness. An important part of that, what Paul is saying too, if we'll remember some of what's going on here, is he's trying to challenge those who are, are being persecuted, and that's uh, the Thessalonians that are being persecuted, those who are wrestling with those who are presenting false teachers, uh, saying you need more than the gospel, perhaps, right? You need to do this and that and everything. And Paul's saying the gospel is what we proclaim to you, and we taught it fully. See, when he uses that fatherly imagery, we didn't just present it to you. We were your teacher, your educator. You learned what you needed to under our pastoral leadership so hold on to that don't think you have to add something more and in case we feel like we're reading into that he clarifies it even more so at the end in verse 13 he says we constantly give thanks for you i'm going to touch on this thanksgiving again in a minute as doc did as we're entering this month of giving thanks right this season shall we say of giving thanks but paul said that when you receive the word of god right when you received the word of God, you accepted it, not as human word, but as what it really was, God's word, which is also at work in you, believers. They received it, he's saying, 
Don't create, don't complicate it, don't make it something it's not. Our faith is because it's a gift. We've received it. And God's word is that it's the gospel. It's the good news. It's not what we do. It's just like those Israelites who were traveling as Nora said through that barren land. They couldn't do anything, right? I love the way you said that, Doc. They were foreigners. They were helpless. Aren't we helpless in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, in our wandering ways without a savior? Paul said, hold on to the truth of the gospel. It will set you free. And as Paul always does, and I'm grateful, he begins his letter with thanksgiving. He ends his, well, this isn't the beginning and ending, but in this specific, specific portion, he expresses gratitude throughout. He's an encourager. I think he uses that word somewhere in here. If not, he should have. All right. He is an <laughs> encourager, right? Uh, isn't that what great teachers do? I bet you Jennifer Huddleston is an encourager because I've heard from too many of her students who speak of what an educator she was. I know Lynn Hill, when she was in a classroom, was an encourager. I know that Doris Howe, when he's mentoring these young dentists, is an encourager because you're saying this is what God's done for you and this is what's possible through trusting in God's grace every step of the way. I give thanks for you. Give thanks for the good news and life-giving love of our Lord. Amen. 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 That was so good. Ah, I'm out of breath. I almost went to preaching that time. <laughs> oh, aren't these beautiful the way they tie together? Doc talked yeah. about Thanksgiving. Mine had some reference to Thanksgiving. Uh, so we're grateful. Let's see what Jennifer has to say about this Joshua. Okay. All right. Mine has a little bit of deliverance and, and miracles in it. So mm. I think you'll see a little bit of connection there. Uh, I'm reading Joshua chapter three, verses seven through 17. The Lord said to Joshua, this day, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so that they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priest who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know that among you is the living God who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Go again. <laughs> the, ark of the, the ark of the covenant of the lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the jordan so now select 12 men from the tribes of israel one from each tribe when the souls of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the lord the lord of all the earth come to rest in the waters of the jordan the waters of the jordan flowing from above shall be cut off they shall stand in a single heap Mm. When the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is by Zaranthan, while those flowing toward the Sea of Arabah, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho. While all Israel were crossing over dry ground, the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Amen. Y'all hear her pronouncing all them fancy words there. Let me all, the ites. All, the, <laughs> all the ites. YouTube has been busy today. <laughs> All righty. So uh, I do see a relationship in, in my passage and the ones that we've heard tonight. And I think there'll be some connection okay. to Lynn's as well. But uh, this is this is about a big change that happens for the Israelite people. They're getting a new leader. Yeah. And it's it's like a new beginning for them under new leadership. And and I know. And I think we all do that new beginnings aren't always easy. Yeah. Sometimes there's growing pains and there's there's a lot of trust that has to develop during those times. I know uh, several years ago, um, about 12 years ago, 
I got the chance to to move up from teaching 11th grade to teaching 12th grade. Okay. And there was a lady who'd been teaching 12th grade. She she had been my teacher, uh, quite a formidable lady, an awesome teacher, wonderful person. And I was very intimidated, to say the least, to be stepping up into the role that she had just vacated. I thought, mm. that's, that's going to be rough. And I know when I came into the classroom that had been hers, uh, looked in the file cabinets, you just kind of check out the every, everything. She had taken all the paperwork with her. She did not leave anything in the file cabinets at all except empty file folders. Mm. And at first I was a little hurt that she didn't leave me anything, you know, to start with. But before the end of the first year, I kind of understood why she did it. And I appreciate that she did because she didn't want me to try to be her or try mm. to be like her. She just wanted me to, to teach my way and to do do what I wanted to do. And and I, I thanked her years later for that, uh, you know, that I did understand. So mm. that's a long winded beginning there. But we have Joshua who's taking over the role that's been vacated by Moses. Now, Moses, we know, has been for the people of Israel. He's he's been everything for them. It's, you know, he's been the mediator between them and God. He's been yeah. the one who led them out of Egypt after 400 years of, of life and then ultimately captivity there. Uh, they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, he he spoke to God on their behalf. Uh, when they were too scared to speak to God, he, he was there for them. He brought them the word of the Lord, the Ten Commandments, and then took care of them as they wind their way through the desert for the next 40 years. And now it's Joshua's turn. And I love the way that this starts because it doesn't start with Joshua saying anything. It starts off with the Lord said to Joshua. Good. So, you know, that he's speaking to him and he says, this day I will, and I love this word, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so that they will know I will be with you like I was with Moses. That's good. So he's letting him know, this is just the start, Joshua. I'm going to start and we're going to build you up just like just like I did Moses. You stick with me and I've got your back. I'm going to make sure that the people know that, that I'm with you just like I was with Moses. That's great. And that, that's so important. You know, it was a process. It wasn't going to be like he was going to jump to Moses status overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he, you know, that the Lord says, I'm going to be the one to make you great. And he says, I want the people to trust in you. I want them to know that I'm with you. Okay. So the people, basically they wandered and their wandering is almost over. Okay, they're they're ready to cross over the Jordan River into, quote, the promised land. Mm -hmm. And and so we've had this huge buildup for so long in the Bible to get to this moment. And some of the commentaries said it almost seems anticlimactic that it's over with in just a few verses. Yeah. Without as much detail. But I really like, you know, what it says here. Give simple instructions about. Uh, picking these priests who are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant down into the Jordan first. A few things about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you may be like I am, a fan of Raiders of the Lost Ark, so you yes. may have the Anna Jones connection there. Just a few <laughs> other uh, pieces of information. The Ark was a rectangular chest uh, measuring approximately 45 inches in length, 27 inches in width, and 27 inches in height. It was covered with pure gold inside and out mm. uh, and had a solid gold cover with two cherubim facing each other. Uh, besides the Ten Commandments, it was said to contain a jar of manna and Aaron's staff, uh, and it symbolized the presence of God. Frequently, uh, the Israelites would carry it into battle with them, or they would let the Ark of the Covenant lead them into battle. Uh, as far as the Ark's fate... Uh, it's unknown. It disappeared from historical records after the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BC. And its location has been the subject of speculation and mystery ever since. So uh, nobody knows exactly where it is right now, but it's kind of a, a neat little mystery there. But mm -hmm. 
when the the feet of those men hit the Jordan, all of a the sudden there's another parting. There's a parting of the water. You know, we we always think of the Red Sea, but I guess I, I'd never really dwelt on this one nearly as much. Yeah. You know, that the water is held back again and they're they're cut off in a single heap. And then the people were allowed to cross the Jordan. And it said that it, you know, there were so many of them that it could have been a stretch almost a mile long for them to kind of stretch wow. and go through there at that point in time. But the priest carrying the ark stay there in the bed, the, the dry bed of the Jordan River while the people pass by. And they were, uh, by law, I don't know exactly the amount of distance, but they had to stay, uh, you know, within That's so, right. you know, away from it. Because if anyone <clears throat> other than the Levites or those specifically uh, who had been selected to touch the Ark of the Covenant got close to it, uh, it could spell out disaster, it could spell out death. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, why all this ceremony? Why just, you know, why not just cross the river? Why, why such a, another grand moment there? And I think it was, it was to create this miracle that people would remember. Mm, that's good. You know, all of these Israelites who wandered in the desert, they had lived through all these other things. They lived through the trials. They had lived through the crossing of the Red Sea. They remembered what it was like um, to hear God shake the mountain and shake the ground. And here we have a whole new generation, the ones who were actually going to go into this promised land. And this was their moment. This was their time to see God at work for them on their behalf. Literally, the Ark of the Covenant represented to them the presence of God. Yeah. And as God goes into the water, you know, in, in the, the Ark of the Covenant, that's what parts the waters and and he keeps there until all of them are safely across and then comes out of the water. Um, and so I kind of, as I was looking at this, kind of looked at a couple of different things. Obviously, Joshua, you know, had to be feeling the pressure to, yeah. to be the leader, to get everything right. But I love that that he never tried to take credit for any of this. It's all, this is what God wants us to do. You're going to see God at work. It's not, look at me. I can do things just as great as Moses can. He, like Moses, puts all the focus on God. And I thought that was that was so important for him as a young leader. And then we just Good. got the Israelites themselves. You know, before this water parts and before Joshua gives them this message from God, these people have been wandering for 40 years and they see this big, long river that's kind of flooding in front of them. There's no bridges. They can't go around it. You know, it, it, there's the, it's deep and wide. Like the song says, Yeah, it's impassable. So, so they're looking for a way. So they've been wandering in this wilderness. And I kind of thought that's like a metaphor for us. All of us sometimes probably have a wilderness that we're wandering through in our lives. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not literally for 40 years like the Israelites, but we all have issues and problems that exhaust us and and make us feel terrible and make us doubt. And, you know, as much as we'd like to to jump from the beginning to the, the happy ending at the moment, we don't always get that. We can't always jump straight to the good thing. And. I think that's we just kind of like the Israelites have to step out in faith like these priests did. They were willing to step into the water and that changed everything for them. It, it actually says that until the priest actually, their feet actually came to rest in the waters of the Jordan, that's when everything moved. That's when everything kind of changed. Mm -hmm. And so until they kind of stepped out in their faith, God didn't actually kind of get to work. So I kind of thought that's the way for us to, you know, we don't have to go through the wilderness alone. Just like the Israelites didn't have to go through the wilderness alone. God's with us. And as long as we're willing to kind of step out in faith and take that first step, God, God's going to be there. 
he's going to be there waiting for us. And, you know, depending on our situation, that first step may look different for different people. But as long as we're willing to kind of step out and get our feet wet, kind of like the Israelites did, we can get to our promised land too. We can get to that better life. We can get to a life where we feel fulfilled and complete in God. And I just thought that was, that was such an amazing thing that is only in just a few short verses that these people stepped out in faith and we can too. Yeah, that's great. And that's all I got. Thanks. I love that. I do too. I love that. Thank you for pointing out, I'll begin to exalt you. I know. I love that, Jen. It's so easy to just read over that. Thanks for pointing that out to us. Yeah. It's just beginning. Amen. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have the gospel, and it, I'm going to be reading uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 12, and it was a hard decision, but I'm going to read from the NIV tonight. I wanted to read from the message, but I chose the good old NIV. So. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to call you are not to be called rabbi, for you only have one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. So if we'll remember last week and a little bit the week before, um, Jesus is encountering the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, they've, they've been butting heads just a little bit. Jesus, uh, they're trying to trap Jesus by asking these questions. And Jesus just effortlessly turns it around on them and drives home his point. And uh, they have no um, recourse with him. They, they know he's right. So, of course, they're beginning to uh, not like him. And the plan is <laughs> afoot to discredit him. So anyway, but in, in uh, chapter 23, it's starting out with this. And um uh, you know, throughout Matthew's gospel, you know, Jesus is critical of the Pharisees. He's kind of calling them out. But most of us would never expect Jesus to hear Jesus say this. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. What? <laughs> what? Let me read that again. But he is critical of the Pharisees, but he's not critical because they keep the law. That's not what he's critical about. Um, he, he's, he's, he's critical of the Pharisees' actions, but only because they do not practice what they teach or practice what they preach, you know, like mm -hmm. what we like to say. He's, the Pharisees' teachings of them themselves are not a problem, but the practice, the observance of the law becomes a burden on the shoulders of others oh, while the good. Pharisees are reaping all the public acclaim. So he, he's, he's cautioning everyone about this, you know, and, and Matthew kind of characterizes Jesus as an excellent teacher because he interprets the law. Let's see with an eye to God's larger vision for, and the love of humanity. That, wow. that was the difference hey. between the Pharisees and Jesus. Um, 
It says, Jesus teaches others to keep the law in a way that also meets the demands of God's justice and God's mercy. And that word mercy really plays a part here. Um, because I don't think being merciful was a strong characteristic of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I think it was more like judgment. Mm. Um, another thing as a teacher, Jesus's actions are consistent with his teachings. Um, your best teachers yeah. are going to practice what they teach and they're going to, to live that life. If, uh, you know, they're, if they're trying to inspire and to care for their students, not only with teaching them, but caring about them. And Jennifer, I, I know I was just nodding my head, just up and down like a little thing on a, on a car <laughs> when they were saying it, because, I'll, you know, my boys love Jennifer Huddleston uh, because they know she truly cared about them and she yeah. did encourage them and she um, tried you know, her best, they knew they had a friend in her and, and an advocate. So, but I think that that's your best teachers are those people. Um, and Jesus is the best example of any teacher that I've ever known. So, but throughout Matthew's gospel, we're seeing Jesus practice the law in the light of God's justice and mercy. Here we go. Note that mercy again, justice and mercy. He okay. honors, uh, the Sabbath and feeds the hungry. He he keeps the Sabbath while bringing God's wholeness to people. You see what I'm saying? He's honoring yeah. the teaching, but he's also it's there's mercy just interspersed and threaded within that. He cures the leper and sends him to the priest. You know, yeah. so yeah. Jesus Jesus's message is very similar to the prophets who came before him. Um, you know, he he quoted Hosea. Um, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He quotes that twice in Matthew's gospel. There we go again. Jesus That's good. was a student of the Old Testament. You know, it's, he said um, one of those references when he was, he was uh, when they criticized him for eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, he said, um, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mm -hmm. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. And uh, I just, you know, his response is it doesn't mean that tax collecting and sinning, you know, are good things. And, and he doesn't argue with keeping the Sabbath that is bad, is a bad thing. But he suggests that keeping the law without exercising mercy doesn't fulfill what God expects. Mm, you know, so that that's how god treats us and that's how he wants us to treat others so so anyway um he that's why i think matthew characterized jesus or the messiah as a teacher you know a teacher not a not a preacher a teacher uh he says you're not supposed to be called teacher because you have one teacher one instructor and that's the messiah so all right, so the next part, it says living according to God's word means living as a servant. The greatest among you will be your servant. And uh, Jesus' criticism of the Pharisees suggests that the problem is that they use the law as a pretense to receive honor from others. You know, we're all a little bit like that. I know I am. I know I am. You know, it's it's so tempting. And, and I don't think it just happened all of a sudden with the Pharisees and Sadducees. They studied, they worked hard. They had all these, all the acclaim put on them. And after a while, they just became to expect that and they needed that. Um, and, you know, Jesus is calling them out on it. And um, Jesus's interpretation of the law underscores that humans are on a level playing field. Sinners, Sadducees, tax collectors, Pharisees, all the ites, yeah. <laughs> like to, all on a level playing field. God extends mercy to all. He doesn't exclude anyone, Amen. Every the tax collector and the sinner. And the one that seeks attention and status through God's law misinterprets it. You know, that there, it says the attitude of a servant is much more appropriate. And I thought this was important. 
because the servant shapes their actions according to the master's will. Oh, good. And he didn't use servant. He didn't use slave. A servant shapes the actions according to the master's will. That's and that right. is that's what God wants of us because that's the best thing for us. That is how we truly receive Amen. God's grace and mercy. So, um, so to me, this election was a lot about humility and learning, learning how important it is to be humble. And I came across this, um, this little section written by this guy. And I just thought it was just too good not to share because <laughs> this is so in here right here. It's so funny, yeah. but it's great. And um, so it's, it, we're going to look at Matthew 23, 12. We're going to focus on that little verse there for just a few minutes. And it says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Well, it said that this verse just makes you want to pray for humility, which is something that's kind of hard. It's not natural for us to do that sometimes. And it's it just it just goes against the grain of our sinful nature. You know, that we're so focused on ourselves. We're constantly tempted every day to think about ourselves. You know, you do you. I mean, oh my goodness, you know, that that's the culture that we're in. And it says, I see this in my own life. I'm tempted in daily, daily conversations to turn conversations in a way that will be favorable toward me. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm to think about what can I do in a way that will help my standing in someone else's eyes. And then, and then you just got to think, no, 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 I can't do that. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So we're constantly tempted to exalt ourselves. Yeah. So we got to pray for humility. So in praying for humility, I just pray and I pray and I try and I try for humility. And once I get there, I'm just so proud of it. Oh, <laughs> just, isn't that just the way? I yeah, mean, that's is. just the way. And you think, I'm there. Golly, I'm proud of myself. Oh, no, I can start all over. So it's really hard. It's hard. Hard to be humble, in the words of Mac Davis. The, yes, the Mac. Like right, Mac Davis, and that song jumped in my head when I read this passage too. Um, it's it's just, but it's just the essence of what it is to follow Christ. You've got to really deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. You've got to die to yourself, and say, "I want my life to be about you alone, Jesus. I want, I want everything that yeah. you have." And um, so I'm, I've just been all over the place. I've chased so many schools. Oh, it's beautiful. But it really spoke to me about that because I thought, you know, and sometimes I think, you know, when Jen, when you talked about Joshua and the Lord said, I'm going to begin to exalt you. Yeah. It didn't start out with Joshua saying, okay, now I'm fixing to get exalted and we're going to go do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. It, it wasn't that. The, that's the Lord's job. It's not our job. And sometimes I think we feel like it is and it's not. And it's, temp it's also tempting to let others do that. And, and, and you know, and you, you got you to gotta back away from that, you know, and, and tell me you appreciate it. But everything I am, I owe to God that he. He did, he's done all of it, I'm, I've, and I thank him for it, but I want to use it to his glory. Oh, you see what I'm saying? Right. That's, what, that's, what it, that's where it gets real. You know, you got to understand that. Um, everything that you've been given, you have been given. Amen. God has given that's it to good. So, but anyway, I just... Uh, I'd love to say I was very humbled by this passage, yeah. <laughs> and, and I was, but I know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to get all exalted again. I'm just going <laughs> to, <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know, I think that's just human nature. And, and, um, uh, and he said, you know, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And I think I just need to tattoo that on my arm and read it every huh. day. So don't we, 
but that it really spoke to me in a lot of different ways. And, and I want to be more mindful of that and to pay attention to that. And, um, and also not to be a stumbling block to anyone else, you know, about that. Mm. I've got to find the difference between supporting and exalting. So, but I will call on the Lord to help me with that. Yes. But uh, one, one last thing about humility. Um, Frederick Bigner, who I love, um, he said, humility is often confused. Lynn Howes will love this. Humility is often confused with saying you're not much of a bridge player when you know per perfectly well you are. Conscious or otherwise, this kind of humility is a form of gamemanship. If you really aren't much of a bridge player, you're apt to be rather proud of yourself for admitting it so humbly. <laughs> and that kind of humility is a form of low comedy. True humility doesn't consist of thinking ill of yourself, but of not thinking of yourself much differently from the way you'd be apt to think of anybody else. It is the capacity for being no more and no less pleased when you play your own hand well when your opponents do. So I thought that was that was pretty cool about what he said about humility. That was I thought that was interesting. So absolutely beautiful. But that's I'm all I have notes. for tonight. I'm taking notes as feverishly as I can. That's beautiful. <laughs> Just wow, y'all. What a great study. I just, I hope all of our attendees have uh, enjoyed it. My cup is overflowing tonight. I think this was a wonderful study. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Said another good night of teaching. Thank y'all. You're welcome, Elizabeth. It really did bless me. Emily had said earlier, Doc, that was all we needed, or we all needed that. Absolutely. And good to see her. And, and Phyllis, I know you. Uh, battered and bruised glad you're on with us ginger so good to see you on with us tonight too and wanda even got my mom on there maybe pops listen i bet he's sleeping though he probably fell asleep <laughs> y'all think no that's my preaching he sleeps in he didn't sleep during y'all's bible study he doesn't i'm kidding what a great lesson i'm just overjoyed and uh miss lynn would you pray for us as we depart tonight oh yeah God, the fact that we're even able to pray right now is such evidence of your grace and your mercy. So may it cause our hearts to realize that in ourselves, we are hopeless. It is only because of you, your grace and your glory that we have life. Christ Jesus, help us share the gospel and ourselves too with the ones you give us to serve. Let us be gentle with them as a nursing mother cares for her mm. children. If tassels, fine clothes, and terms of respect can help us to serve others with warmth, then put tassels all over us. But since humility must undergird all service, then let our real place of honor be in the very last place with you. Amen. Amen. God, a beautiful prayer. Thank you so much. And I am just so grateful. I'm overjoyed. Hope y'all were. Absolutely. It was a good night. Hope everyone had a wonderful evening. Yeah. God bless you all. Good night, Thanks. everybody. Blessings to all. Love to all. Love Bye. you. Thank good night. You.